Hey everybody, welcome to 3 Minute Thursdays. It's your source of animal rights news and gossip all packed into a short, sweet three minutes on everyone's favorite day, which naturally is a Thursday. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Turn on the little bell notification if you like. Uh, follow along on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as Clubhouse. We've been doing some fun things over there. And if you're interested in joining the Patreon, every uh, dollar you pledge is put 100% towards grassroots animal rights projects or sanctuaries. Um, and this month is pretty exciting. The second month, a donor is going to be matching uh, all of us dollar for dollar. If we raise $1,500, we are giving away $3,000, which I think is pretty cool. Last month, our donation was matched as well, and we gave $2,993 to AgriPunk, which is like a sanctuary in Italy that won a campaign to shut down a turkey farm, and then they managed to take over the land and turn it into a farm sanctuary, which is pretty amazing. It's a cool story. If you want to check it out, I'll drop some links down below. So has, has anyone seen a good documentary lately? I will say the irony is not lost on me that I made a video in part critiquing Seaspiracy for like cherry picking data and talking points and then a wide range of people from a wide range of backgrounds who are also upset about said cherry picking of data then cherry picked talking points or my video to push their own agendas and take me out of context. <laughs> Which led me to being accused of like being paid by the animal ag industry or being a shill for the seafood industry and someone actually suggested that I should look at this uh, documentary called The Animal People uh, to maybe get some more ideas on how to actually make change. You know, you know, that's like, that's me, right? Like, yeah, some of those interviews are like 20 years old, but, but, but that's me. Okay. So did anyone else watch that like whole thing going down in the Suez Canal and think like, this is why pressure campaigns work so well. No, no, was it? No, that was just me. No, maybe, maybe I have a problem. Let me make the analogy and, and tell me what you think. So, so for folks that don't know, the Suez Canal is like a 120 mile canal that connects the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea and makes shipping much easier globally because ships from Europe and, and beyond don't need to go around the Cape of Good Horn in order to get to, uh, around Africa and out to the, it doesn't matter. So when a massive container ship like, was wedged in the Suez Canal, like drifted and got stuck in there, the passage was like completely shut down. Something like 450 ships were stuck behind it waiting to get through. And, and like the blocking of the supply chain cost businesses globally $9.6 billion of trade. That's $6.7 million a minute. If there's ever an example of like what happens when you can actually affect the supply chain of your target, I think the Suez Canal will be it. So a lesson learned, don't underestimate what you can accomplish by using a campaign to slow down or halt uh, the supply side of supply and demand. But let's look at like a real world example of a pressure campaign. Coalition to abolish the fur trades campaign against Saks Fifth Avenue. So if you've been watching my channel, you know I've been talking about this more than you probably want to hear. But this is why I was. Today they announced that Saks uh, was going fur free. They won the campaign, which is amazing. So I, I thought it would be interesting maybe to break down the campaign to see what I think they did right and why it worked. So this is coming from like an outsider's perspective, right? I didn't organize the campaign. I'm just gathering this info from following along just like the rest of you on social media and just paying attention to what they were doing. So, so take that for what it's worth. But here's why I think it worked. First, I think they built up a lot of momentum and community by going after smaller targets with a higher potential for victory. So the first campaign was against like this designer that I can never pronounce the name of. Um, and that designer was using fur in like a variety of their lines. And the campaign kicked off fairly locally, like organized by just a handful of people, but it was fast. Uh, it was pretty hard hitting and, and it got a lot of people's attention, including the designer, which led the designer to agree to go fur free, like all in like a matter of a couple weeks. That was like a tangible win, right? It was a victory people could see and it, and it be a part of, and it lit like the spark in people's minds. The second campaign was a little bit bigger. It was going after a boutique that sold fur and they had a little bit wider range, a little bit bigger of an audience. So, but they also managed to win that campaign in just a few weeks. And this created buzz. It created interest. It showed the movement that they could win, that we could win, that we could win quickly and we could win by doing grassroots pressure campaigns. So when CAF picked their next target, they could go after something bigger and, and a little bit more ambitious. And they picked Saks Fifth Avenue. And this is a high-end department store chain. And they made $4.9 billion in 2019. Like this isn't like a small target. CAF's campaign kicked off, I think at the beginning of February and using that momentum from like the other campaigns, they were able to expand participation from just a couple of locations to cities across North America. They, they had people working on it in, in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Miami, St. Louis, New Jersey, Boston, Connecticut, Chicago, Philadelphia, Atlanta, Toronto, and, and I think even more than that. 
they use like a handful of different tactics to further their strategy. They put enough pressure on their target, Saks Fifth Avenue, and specifically their president and CEO, Mark Metric, that they are pressured into abandoning fur. And again, I'm just looking at this campaign and like taking educated guesses. But the second reason I think it worked as well as, as it did is because the campaign successfully targeted the five points of intervention. Now, I know you're thinking like, what in the hell is that? But if you've been following along with me since about May 2020, you may have uh, seen this video. This is where I break down the organizing philosophy that suggests you need to disrupt as many of these five different places within the system in order to win. So if you want to check out the whole thing, eh, there you go. I'll spare you a little bit of time. Here's, here's the quick overview. So let's talk about these five points of intervention. And so the first point is the point of production. This one is pretty straightforward. It's the point where what we are opposed to is produced. Second point, which is the point of destruction. This point is the point where all the actual harm and destruction is happening. So the third point is the point of consumption. So this is obviously where the general public consumes the thing we are trying to stop. The fourth point I would argue is probably the most important as it is where the ability to actually change what we want to change can like physically occur. And that's the point of decision. This is where, quote, the power to act on a campaign's demands rests. The fifth and final point is kind of the wonkiest, right? It's the most abstract. And that's the point of assumption. This point is often described as, as the, quote, building blocks of ideology. It's where beliefs and politics and values uh, live and grow. So there are the five points of intervention, production, destruction, consumption, decision, and assumption. So the campaign relied heavily on protest, both outside the store and, and with disruptions inside the store. Some were small, some were big, but as long as they were sustained, it would keep that pressure on Saks Fifth Avenue. And by protesting at the department stores, they were able to put pressure on both the point of consumption, as that is where the people are consuming the product, purchasing the product, and the point of decision because there are managers here, there are potentially regional managers or corporate higher-ups at these stores. These are people that have the ability to make or influence decisions about the future of SACs. So when they weren't in front of the stores, they were, they were on phones. Uh, phone actions are super easy to set up, right? You find a few numbers within the corporate hierarchy, you write up a short, polite script, and people can make their voices heard from the comfort of their own home, which I think is also a great tactic to use particularly in a pandemic. So phone actions against Saks where phone calls were made like not just to store branches, but also to Saks headquarters means that I think you could say they were targeting both the point of decision because you were communicating directly with decision makers, but also targeting that point of production. Point of production like is, is generally factories and things like that. But I do think, you know, since the targeting of production is also about disrupting places where you could quote leverage labor power, I think disrupting headquarters could have the ability to turn like labor force against the decision makers. I think you could probably argue that, you know, protests in front of stores and chains would also be uh, fall into that category as well. Social media, as always, was was also an important tactic in the campaign, not just like to alert people to upcoming protests, but also, you know, to talk about uh, or talk to people about the issues around Saks and involvement with fur um, and also just the fur industry in general. So by doing that, like general outreach around the issues, both online and offline, like at also again at those demonstrations and also firing like proverbial shots across the bow of the fur industry, I think the campaign was disrupting both the point of assumption by challenging people's thoughts on the use of fur, but also disrupting that point of destruction, which here would be, of course, the, the fur industry, particularly fur farms. So I think that one's a little wonky, but I do think, you know, when, when you are sending a message that this is a campaign that's part of a broader issue to, to ban fur farming, to end fur farming, to, to shut down the fur industry, I, I do think, you know, you could slide it into that, like, point of disruption if need be. So in, in a little more than two months of campaigning, Saks announced they would go fur free. Like, from a distance, you could look at this campaign as, as like, a bunch of people doing some loud, sometimes, like, obnoxious demonstrations, and, and Saks gave to the pressure. But even if it wasn't intentional in the Saks campaign, although I personally think it was, you can dissect this campaign and, and many others like it and see the theories of change and the organizing philosophies playing out and working. Like it's not just stuff people write online or in books. It's not just stuff I'm rambling about on like a stupid YouTube channel. It's like rooted in history and practice and failures and victories. And you take all that and you learn from it and you grow bigger and you grow more successful. And that's 
when I think we can start to see how change will really happen. So congrats to CAFT, congrats to everyone who organized and participated in the campaign. And now more than ever, keep fighting.